We bring you some of the topics from our over two-hour DVD video. First, the RFNP railroad that bridged the CNO with the BNO and others, followed by some mergers to save a crumbling rail network that seemed vital but that failed to happen. The Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, or RFNP, was a 113-mile-long line that connected other railroads between the Potomac River and Washington, D.C., down to Richmond, Virginia, shown here in relationship with the B&O and C&O railroads. This was a double-track, speedy bridge line. The RFNP linked with the ACL and SAL from Richmond, Virginia, north to Alexandria, Virginia, and nearby Washington, D.C., where connections to the Pennsylvania and the Chesapeake and Ohio railroads were made. For service into New York, the Pensy was used. That later became the Penn Central, and finally, Conrail. The RF&P had a fleet of 20 E-8 units for supporting passenger trains. Of the 20, 15 were A units. This scene is in 1972, with two E units used on this freight train. This freight is led by an FP-7 down the double-track speedway of the RF&P. A northbound trailer train is led by unit number 126, one of seven GP-40s delivered in 1967. The brick building is the RF&P's AF interlocking tower to control traffic through here. Number 103 is a 1950 built GP7 with air reservoir tanks on the roof. This train is heading north to nearby Potomac Yard. That yard has since been removed. This northbound is about one half a mile from the Alexandria passenger station. Next is a southbound in front of the station. Both Potomac Yard and Alexandria Yard were eliminated in the merger of the RF&P into CSX in 1991. Here, an Amtrak former Seaboard Coastline E-8, equipped with the cab signal box, leads an RF&P E unit and a Seaboard Coastline E unit still in black. The former Seaboard Coastline train became a popular Amtrak train by 1971. Many, but not all, of the Seaboard Coastline passenger E units had cab signals. Amtrak 422 was a former Union Pacific No. 945. The Southern Railway ran the Southern Crescent from New Orleans to Washington, D.C., independently of Amtrak until 1979, when the train finally became another Amtrak train. Cars with the black roofs are former seaboard cars.
In the back of this train are some Tropicana juice cars in the former original white paint. These went north from sunny Florida in solid trains and returned south in smaller groups as they were unloaded. The caboose was formerly from the Clinchfield Railroad. In this freight is an old Atlantic Coastline boxcar. Tracks off to the far right went to a small southern railway yard that is now reclaimed land used for shopping and office developments. This is one of the nine SW1500 EMD switchers that were bought in 1966 and 1967. Back then it was still necessary to reblock many of the trains that came from the Seaboard Coastline, Southern Railway, and from the north, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Although CNO passenger trains ran through here, CNO freight trains did not. Once CSX merged the RFNP into the system, the yard in Alexandria became mostly unnecessary. It became just another link in the overall CSX system. Even so, it's a very nice double track section of high quality.
The RF&P was no longer a bridge line linking the separate lines of the north and the south. Much of the land for the Potomac Yard was converted to property development projects. All RF&P road locomotives had automatic cab signals that required a special box on the lead locomotive. This was a safer way to operate, where the track signal indications were displayed in the engineer's cab. It was impossible to mistakenly run by a red signal in a fog or lack of attention looking out the cab window. Trains forwarded over the RF&P needed either an RF&P-owned lead locomotive or a foreign road locomotive with compatible equipment.
The last half of the twentieth century was replete with mergers that could have been, but came up short. Had these not to be mergers been made, each in its own way would have altered the outcome of the rail map in profound ways that are interesting to speculate about now. The Plan C came about from the failure of many eastern roads that needed to be reorganized with some hope of survival. At least the tracks that served the customers would remain. The bankruptcy of the Penn Central had focused everyone's attention on solving the Northeast Railroad's problems. Many feared outright government seizure of the railroads in recognition of their failure to run their affairs as private entities. The government's United States Railway Administration, or USRA, looked to the newly minted Chessie system in 1973 to bail out several bankrupt smaller roads that would have added several thousand more route miles. This plan was not just taking in duplicate tracks to the Chessie system. This would have brought new industrial markets into play at Scranton, New York City, Harrisburg, New Jersey, and Upper State New York, to mention a few. It would have been a marketing department's dream. The principal route additions would have been 1,600 miles of the bankrupt Erie Lackawanna. The EL's tracks would have stretched from Akron and Cleveland, Ohio east to New York City and the chemical industries in New Jersey. Another inclusion had 420 miles of the Reading Railroad in the offering. That would have nicely bridged the original b &O lines from Philadelphia into New York City. The USRA offering included the equipment and none of the accumulated debt and no obligation to fund the large commuter rail operations that both roads had been saddled with. By 1976, the deal began encountering snags with the various unions concerning employees of the bankrupt roads. They would not agree to accept the wages and work rules of the Chessie system's workforce. It seemed to the Chessie system that these old wages and work rules were part of the reason for these roads being bankrupt. The unions did not want to set new, lower standards, and Chessie could foresee new higher wages suddenly expanding into their own workforce. So the unusual offer of a pre-approved, expanding merger just came apart at the seams. In April 1976, the Erie Lackawanna and the Reading were then quietly rolled into the new Conrail system that had been formed out of the Penn Central Railroad and six other bankrupt roads. So here we see a former Reading diesel already paint patched with CR marks leading a blue Conrail SD35 on the old Reading tracks that became part of Conrail. Chessie would just move ahead with what they already had. They would slowly consolidate newly defined operating divisions and unify marketing strategies. No drastic steps meant no missteps, such as some of the other roads had made in mergers before. The future held a more significant merger with the seaboard system to form CSX. As for Conrail, with lots of struggles, they did become a success. only to be cut in two pieces by 1997 and merged into the CSX and Norfolk Southern as the final big change in Eastern Railroading. We cover the many phases of the Conrail story in our Conrail Hall of Fame presentation. Starting in the 1970s, the average person believed as truth 
the myth that railroads had become unnecessary and a quaint relic of a century ago. Looking at some of the railroads in the 1960s and 70s back east, you could understand that conclusion. In many ways, it was a more interesting era, with quaint operating practices, more locomotive variety, cabooses, and graffiti was totally unknown. Numerous lineside structures were scattered around, and the diesels smoked and made more noise. The darker side was that the industry knew that the public and government sentiment was leaning toward nationalizing the U.S. roads. The collapse of the Penn Central merger that was totally bankrupt by 1970 triggered that prevailing attitude. It took a lot of difficult changes and work from management and labor to dig out of that era and keep the railroads in private hands. The truth is that fuel and dollar costs per ton mile greatly favor shipping over land by rail. Mergers have brought more efficient railroads that have better track and equipment to exploit their natural advantage. The advantage is the steel wheel rolling on steel rail wastes less energy than tires on asphalt or concrete highways. That will still be viable in the 21st century. We have many more historic railroad topics that are more rewarding than simply watching trains zipping back and forth. This DVD video and so many more is available from our website. Be sure to like and subscribe to keep more content coming. And thanks for watching.